This Week in Startups is brought to you by SendPro Online from Pitney Bowes. Save time and money no matter what you ship or mail. Try it free for 30 days and get a free 10-pound scale when you visit pb.com slash twist. Capterra, the leading free online resource to find your best software solutions. Visit capterra.com slash twist for free to find the right tools to make 2019 the year for your business. And Silicon Valley Bank, purpose-built for founders and high-growth startups, Silicon Valley Bank offers banking and financial solutions that fit every stage of the startup journey. Visit svb.com forward slash next to learn more. Silicon Valley Bank, ideas bank here. Upcoming launch events. Apply for the next launch accelerator cohort. Applications are due July 18th. Learn more and apply at launchaccelerator.co. You can also apply for our next Founder University, September 9th and 10th in San Francisco at founder.university. Hey, everybody. Hey, everybody. Welcome to another episode of This Week in Startups. As many of you know, I do a lot of events, and I'm fascinated by space, just like Starbucks is. Everybody likes a third space, and that was what Starbucks' success was based on. Not just the coffee your way, but having a space that's not your home and not your work. What is that third space in your life? Some people might say a library, but it's not open that often. Uh, Some people might say school. But what Starbucks did so well is they made it very inviting for people who were leaving their homes, but not yet at work, to go to a third space and do whatever they want, have a conversation. That's what cafe culture was all about in Paris, uh, in London, pub culture, Ireland, pub culture, America, you know, maybe uh, burger joints. Third space is an incredibly important concept, and I've been looking for an investment in this space for a long time because I do events. And here's the challenge I have when I do an event. I want to bring together 50 people, and you go to an event planner, or you go to a hotel or a restaurant, and they look at you and say, how much money can we extract? And how complicated can we make this? And you know, the longer it takes for you to get a quote or a price for something, the more you're going to get screwed. This is true of cars. This is true of apartments. This is true of buying a bed. Anything where they force you to talk to a salesperson, they force you to pick up the phone. What you want is transparent pricing. And you can never get transparent pricing on an event. When I try to do a 50-person event at a hotel, they say it's $1,500 for the room. They say it's a minimum of $18 for coffee per person, $37 for lunch, $125 for dinner. And then all of a sudden I bring 100 people and it's costing three or 400 a person. So annoying, so unnecessary, and it creates so much friction. And then you got to find the ballroom. When I heard about the idea for Neighborly during our accelerator, the launch accelerator, uh, the accelerator run here in San Francisco, when I heard the pitch for Neighborly, I said, why doesn't this exist? And I had that spidey sense, that tingling that as investors occurs when you meet a founder who you know is destined for success with an idea that you say should already exist, but it does not. Today, I'm thrilled to share with you a company I've now invested a couple million bucks in and that I think is destined to become a unicorn in the next three or four years. Sounds crazy, but this is what we do for a living here at launch. Uh, Welcome to the program, Ben Seidel. Hey, Jason. Thanks for having me. Okay, you heard my introduction. Yeah, that was lofty. Thank you. Is that a little bit of a pun there? (laughs) (laughs) A little bit of a pun. Uh, Tell everybody, what is Neighborly and how does it work? Yeah, so very quickly, Neighborly is a network of spaces that you can rent by the hour. Um, They are storefronts that have been repurposed into gathering spaces that you can rent for meetings, events, birthday parties, art shows, pop-up retail, you name it. If you need an affordable, convenient space to use in your city, your neighborhood, your community, uh, we've got a space for you. Okay. What is that hourly rate? Uh, So it depends on the location, but in general, right around $90 to $100 an hour, all in. Okay. And what is the size of that space? Generally speaking, I give you $100, uh, I give you $500 for five hours of space. Mm -hmm. What would the space look like and how big would it be? How many people would it fit? Yeah, in general, it's a ground floor space. It fits around 50 people. It comes included with handcrafted furniture, 
uh, amazing interior design. It comes with a little kitchenette. It comes with appliances like a fridge. Um, and so it's a projection. box. It's a box basically, but it's got all the things that you might need to put together an event or a meeting in in fast fashion and an affordable rate. So we want we want to make it as frictionless as possible. So all the things that you might need, we've got covered. If you need extras, we've got abilities to add those as well. But what is the median square foot? You have five locations, I believe. Six now. Mm -hmm. Have we announced the six? Uh, yeah, we just opened the mission last week. Okay, and I'm going to be one of the first people to use it. You are tomorrow. So all all six locations. Mm -hmm. Jack London Square, Union Square, The Mission. Portland, Oregon. Portland, Oregon. Mm -hmm. And Ber what are the other two? That Berkeley, I'm California. Oh, Berkeley, yes. Mm -hmm. And then the and we've got two in, in Union Square. And two in Union Square. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Tell me the median uh, and range on a square footage basis of these spaces. Yeah, so what we shoot for on average is around 1,700 square feet. That's okay. a that's a perfect size for us. It 1,700 fits, square feet. Yeah, so it fits 50 really well, both seated and, and standing. And um, what we found is that, that that recipe of square footage and location um, really works well for people because you've got people always ask, what's the difference between this and all the other venues out there? Well, most of these venues are set up to be two to 400 person places for big weddings, yes. big corporate conferences, you name it. There's a lot of spaces. And buried somewhere in a hotel, they're... down an escalator, up into the right, and it takes you 10 minutes after you enter the hotel to find it. 100%. And when you do find it, it's a dark, ugly, smelly rug room mm -hmm. uh, with bad lighting. Yep. So Yours are all storefronts on... I would say active or somewhat active streets, yep. easily accessible streets. Is that correct? Yep. And they're all ground floor, so they should be. You should be able to just walk right in off the street. Loading, unloading is really easy. Having your attendees find the space very simple. Um, you know, you don't have to have some kind of lobby person or some kind of security process to get people in. It's in and out, and so it just makes it really convenient and accessible. Um, By the way, that's another place that hotels and event spaces gouge you on. Yep. You you negotiate a price for a, a two day event. And then they go, oh, yeah, it needs $6,000 for load-in day. And you're like, what? And they're like, yeah, you rented the space for forty grand. Now we want to charge you another 6000 to bring your stuff in. Yeah. It's... Or you can bring your stuff in at 6 a.m., two hours before your guests arrive, which is impossible. So here, the load-in is super easy because you're at street mm -hmm. level. Yep. Additionally, if you're at street level, it's easy for your guests to find it. It's yep. as easy to find as a Starbucks. Mm-hmm. Yep, just type in the address and you're right there. This the so easy. You know. So that's that's a big part of kind of why we look for these types of spaces. And instead of kind of copying what the traditional event industry has always done with these massive spaces and gouging you on catering and beverages and services, and uh, you know when we first had uh, we did, our very first location was 700 square feet, and tiny. It was in West yeah. Berkeley in the middle of nowhere, and. Amazon called us at one point and I didn't I thought it was some kind of hoax. I thought they were trying to sell yeah. us something and they were actually inquiring about booking our space and we had been open for three months mm. and had I think nine events at that point. What are the um, most common events right now? If you were to rank the top three in order yeah. of usage of the first six neighborly and for so people know the spelling, it's N E Y B O R L Y dot com, correct? Mm -hmm. Or do we have the dot co or dot com? Dot com. Okay, great. So it's nay, N E Y, Borley. Mm -hmm. Got it. Um, what are the top three in order uses of the spaces to date? Uh, so to date, it is offsite meetings. It is, I would say, family gatherings. So that ranges from birthday parties to um, kids' parties Got it. to family. Got yeah, it. family type things. And then the, I would say the third uh, most popular usage of the space is some type of like pop up retail, art show. Oh activation so people doing some time some type of thing to come together around commerce or or art yeah all right when we get back from this quick break i want to talk about the economics here what it costs to rent a place um and the destruction of retail because it seems to me that neighborly's ascension is a possible solution to the death of retail. We have so many retail spaces. I want to know if I'm correct or not when we get back on This Week in Startups. You are a busy founder, and I don't want you wasting your time and money trying to find the best rate for postage and to send your packages. I want you to use SendPro Online from Pitney Bowes. 
with that product, you're going to be able to send packages and mail right from your desk for as low as, wait for it, $4.99. No, not $499, $4.99. Less than you pay for a pour over coffee here in San Francisco. No matter what you need to send, packages, overnights, letters, just click and save and use this offer for Send Pro online. Only $4.99 a month. You go to pb.com slash twist, pb, as in Pitney Bowes, pb.com slash twist, and you will get a free 30-day trial plus a free 10-pound scale. So you're not wasting any money. You can track your shipments, get email notifications. You're going to gain access to the U.S. Postal Service's savings for letters and priority mail shipping. If you don't know what that is, you'll find out. It's going to save you a bundle. And you can easily compare rates using their online software. Of course, you can print the labels and stamps from your own printer. You know that. That's table stakes today. So I want you to go get that free 30-day trial and the scale at pb.com slash twist. pb.com slash twist. You need to be efficient. You need to use the mail, obviously. And sometimes that can be super inefficient if you have to go to the post office. Now you get the post office in your office. Experience the better way to ship with a free trial to send pro online from Pitney Bowes. Please go save time and go save money and put it into your business. Thanks again to Send Pro Online from Pitney Bowes for supporting this week in startups. I truly and personally appreciate it. Okay, let's get back to this episode. Welcome back to this week in startups. My guest is Ben Saido. He is the co founder and CEO of Neighborly, which we met because you applied to the accelerator, correct? Um, no, actually, before that, I went to your oh. workshop. You went to Founder University? Mm -hmm. Ah, yes, now I remember. Yeah. So for people who don't know, Founder University is a two-day program we do for free for 60 founders who have a product and market but have yet to raise a big Series A. And uh, that Jackie Deegan, who is the producer of This Week in Startups and our um, uh, managing director of education, she picks the companies. It's founder.university for those of you wondering the URL because there's a dot .university extension i'm sure there is so you came to that yep what was it like uh to go to founder university yeah so i'll be quite candid here because yeah. we are on a podcast and yeah. i'm with the jcal yeah. so i might as well be candid yeah um, it's our social contract it's always candid yes at that point so our business had been around for a year and a half mm. at that point and we were raising pre-seed funding and mm. so i had talked to 30 to 40 investors. I don't have a strong network myself. I'm not from the Bay Area. I'm not a previous founder. So it was really tough for me to build that oh. network to raise that initial capital. And so I was striking out, quite frankly. It was mm -hmm. really tough to get into the rooms, get in front of the right people. Um, and I was kind of almost on my last leg, like feeling oh, wow. like I had pitched 40 people. They were all no's, you know. I, right. I didn't really know what the future held. And you held. got cold introductions to them. You just Most, emailed them. A couple also. warm introductions, but a lot of cold stuff. And a lot so, of cold emails, yeah. Yeah, because I don't have a network. And so one of my, someone we had been working with who was helping us develop some of the software was like, hey, I, I know about this workshop that they're putting on in San Francisco. It's run by Jason Calacanis. I've worked with him on a previous thing. You should check it out. And huh. so I applied just on, on a whim. I didn't know what mm -hmm. it was all about, but I knew that it was a chance to get some expert level guidance on on fundraising yeah. and for specifically for companies that were at our stage yeah and so to be quite honest there were probably on my list of fundraising options this yeah. was one of the last things i had yeah and so i was like well i'll go to this couple day thing maybe i'll meet somebody there who knows yeah. like this is Take worth taking a chance on so i went to that and didn't really know what to expect um, and there were six, 59 other founders there from, yeah. from, with companies in market in your with stage. revenue yeah. in our stage, doing very well, doing exciting things. A lot of them are multiple time founders. And so it was just a great group of people. And I thought, well, what are the chances of me walking out of here with some pathway to funding? Huh. Probably pretty low. And you mentioned yeah. it in the room. I mean, it was like, you were only going to fund or even invite to next conversations, two or three of the 60 founders that are yeah. in that room. Usually we confer, we usually will have 10%, six go on to apply to the accelerator mm -hmm. or going to diligence. And maybe of those, half of them or a third of them will then get invited yeah. actually to the accelerator. So I did the mental math and I was yeah. like, well, chances are still low, but at least I'm in the room. Yeah. Um, and so that's that's how I came across launch and what you guys are up to and, and met you and got yeah. the uh, opportunity to pitch you for two what minutes. What was my and reaction when you pitched? I'll never forget it. You took your cell phone and you just turned it over on its face and slammed it on the table and said, this is going to be big. This really? Is, this is going to have network effects okay. like Uber is what you said. Yeah. I don't know if you were like 
two, three coffees deep or Coke Zeros in your case, but yeah. you were excited about it. And Absolutely. So you, your reaction after only a one and a half minute pitch right. was stronger than any other reaction I had gotten from That's any other early stage investor. So it's instructive was, to pause for a second here. Um, to because you've learned, I think, this having gone through the twelve week. You went from the two week founder university program to the twelve week accelerator program, mm -hmm. and two you've day. gone through the two day mm -hmm. founder university, yep. the twelve week accelerator, and you've also done the syndicate. Yep. So it's important to pause for, for a second and just think about numbers. I think uh, for founders, you met with forty, and you got forty no's on your own, and then you went to an event with sixty people, of which let's say we invest in typically three, which is five percent a one in 20 chance, and you were one of the one in 20. It's instructive for founders to understand these statistics. You don't need to get everybody. Hmm. You need only get one. Yep. And then one can become two, and two can become six, and six can become 600 investors. It literally goes that mm -hmm. way. And really, it's that first domino to fall that is so important for founders. And I think it's very candid of you to say you were thinking of packing it in. Yeah. And it's very important for people to realize that investors know less than you in many cases about why your business is going to succeed. Mm -hmm. Many of them just don't get it. I yeah. am introduced famously at Open Angel Forum, which was another event I had created over about 10 years ago. I, invest, I introduced 22 people to Uber and three of us invested. Uh, Siam Bannister, first round, and myself. There were 19 other people who didn't. And then there's that famous Airbnb, which is an interesting corollary to talk about. Airbnb did a blog post. I think they said they invested, they went to meet with 37 and got 37 no's. It's exactly where mm -hmm. you are. Let's fast forward um, to the, you got the $100,000 from us and you came to the accelerator. Mm -hmm. Tell the audience what the accelerator interview process was like as candidly as you can. Um, we didn't prearrange for me to, you know, lean it either way. But tell us what that process was like. You can still do that if you want to. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Tell everybody it's awesome. <laughs> no, no. I, I like the idea of it being candid. Yeah. And then we'll go on to what the candid experience of the accelerator and what you got out of that. Yeah. Yeah. So the because I had already got to know the team mostly um, Here at through, Lynch, yeah. yeah, through Founder University, it did feel a lot more comfortable for me to be able to come in and, and start that launch accelerator application process. So I had already pitched you guys one time before, so I felt confident that you had interest in this idea yep. and I was comfortable with who was going to be in the room. So I did have in some sense a, you know, a shortcut, not a, not necessarily a shortcut, but at least a, a head start. You were coming on, in hot. Yeah, I was coming in hot. I kind of, yeah. I had some rapport already. And um, so I knew what I had to kind of shore up in my pitch mm -hmm. and I knew what you guys saw as potential gaps that I needed to address in the yep. pitch and where I needed to come strong. And so, um, yeah, I came in, did the, uh, the onsite interview here at the, at the headquarters. Yep. Um, and so you interviewed in, with who? Uh, with DeMont and another one of the founders from a previous launch cohort. Great. And did that for a day. And then I came back in, I think you got snowed in in Tahoe. I that did. Week. Yeah. There was an avalanche while I was literally, there were two blizzards in Tahoe and I hit both of them and got delayed both times by a day or two. And on the way back, we were driving back and there was a literal avalanche and they stopped traffic for five hours. So we just went and had lunch and I was like literally in touch with my team. Um, so DeMont- That happens every time you go to Tahoe, right? Uh, it's happened twice. So if you ever want to have good skiing, just go when I go. I'll launch my Twitter. Um, <laughs> so yeah, I did Jason that. Jason DeMont is the managing director of the Accelerator, to be clear. And so you met with him. You met with some founders. Yep. What did the- uh, and this is, I think, very instructive for founders who are listening. The best way to determine if you should go to an accelerator is to talk to multiple people who have already graduated from that program. Do not take the word of the people who run the program. And in this accurate. case, that's me and DeMond and my team. Yeah, I'm saying accurate. don't take our word for it. Yeah, Take the word of the people who graduated mm -hmm. and really drill into them. So what did they tell you? And then how did that match up with reality? And we'll go to day one of the accelerator next yeah so i only had an opportunity to talk to them for a little bit but i did ask questions as far as like the stage that we were at with the traction that we had been experiencing thus far what kind of value could i expect to get out of launch what would they be addressing that we were weak in at that point and what i just talked about a second ago was that we 
really as a first time founder, as a first time executive team, we don't have a lot of connections. And so I was really hoping for the chance to get further connected within this industry and yeah. use this as literally a launch pad for the ability to connect to later stage investors and find someone to support us. Sure. And so that's what I was trying to key in the most with the previous launch founders was. Did you actually get access? Yeah. Did, how did, did that go? What did this result in as yeah. far as your network expansion and access to, to other investors? And everybody was really high on the idea that because it's a smaller cohort in comparison to a lot of these other um, incubators in the Bay Area. We do seven. This, yeah. The small cohort of seven companies really means that you get high quality access to investors. You get a lot of face-to-face -face time with people that are really hard to get in front of. Mm. Um, and that was a massive advantage that you guys have over most of these other accelerators. Yeah. Um, and so I, it made sense to me, obviously a smaller cohort and getting that many investors that you guys get into the room means that I'm just getting more quality time with these people. Yeah. So You're 15% of the energy in the room. Right. Whereas if you were at uh, an accelerator with 50 or 200, mm -hmm. which are the two other major ones do, I think 50 or 200, you would be either 2% or 50 basis points of the energy in the room. Yep. Yeah. So that- so That's that, a big difference. That excited me a lot because that's as, again, as a first time founder, I think that that's super important and, and can't be overlooked. It's just like, you, you, you don't just need a platform. You need quality time too. Yeah. If, if I'm a second or third time founder, sure, I just need a platform to- people to talk to. But yeah. but I also, for this stage that we're at, I, I needed that guidance and that one-on-one -on -one time to really talk through some of these things. And so I, I got the feedback from the other launch founders that this is really what you guys are strongest at. Yeah. Um, and so that made me really excited and, and wanted me, yeah. you know, really- We really to focus forward. on, I think at the Accelerator now, making it the easiest way to raise money for a founder who has a product in market, but doesn't yet have a couple of million dollars invested into the company. So they probably right. have low hundreds of thousands of dollars in both invested capital and revenue. Yep, that's what we had. We had 150,000, uh, no, we only had 100,000 before launch and then you guys gave us 100. So going into the launch accelerator, we only had 200,000. And? And our run rate was 100,000 a month. Your run rate for revenue. Yeah, is for amazing. revenue mm -hmm. uh, at know. that point. So how much did you wind up raising coming out of the accelerator. Yeah, that was an incredible process. Um, so What's we, the number? <laughs> the number was uh, 2.5 million. Okay, when we get back on This Week in Startups, <laughs> I want you to explain how you went from almost quitting, packing it in with Neighborly, to getting into the accelerator and getting that 100K from us, that small investment, and then coming out of it a short three, four months later with $2.5 million in your bank account, when we get back on This Week in Start. It's time for you to look at your software stack and say, what software am I paying for? That is horrible, that is arduous, that's causing me pain and suffering, and find a better solution. Well, how do you find a better solution? Well, if you wanna find a better restaurant, you might go to something like Yelp. If you wanna buy a better hotel, you might go to one of the hotel review sites. If you wanna, you know, you get the idea. There's review sites. I use Metacritic when I'm trying to figure out what to watch. You might use Rotten Tomatoes. What if there was something like that for software? Well, there is. It's called Capterra. C-A-P-T-E-R-R-A. -R -R -A. Capterra is the leading source of free, and it's a free source, of all the greatest reviews of enterprise software. Over 750,000 reviews, and these are from real software users who have done the research and struggled to find better software to make your company more efficient and bionic. And you can search more than 700 specific categories of software. Well, for us, we did it here for sales automation software. Here's how it worked. Our CMO, Presh, uh, put this video together for us to look at. You can see he's looking for a new sales automation software, and he searched through all the reviews. He set some filters like the number of employees that the software is best optimized for, which is, you know, typically if you need 10,000 people or 1,000 people using a piece of software for your company, it's gonna be a lot different than when you have one to 10, right? There's different solutions, simpler ones, complex ones, expensive ones, affordable ones. And Capterra is gonna put all that side by side. And you're gonna see all those great ratings. You're gonna see how good their customer support is, what kind of features and functionality they have. And of course, value for money, because that's what we're all looking for. So we picked one and we're able to do that super easy. We did a trial and we picked Pipedrive. My team at one of my companies love Pipedrive and Captera helped us find it. 
and save us money. So visit Captera.com slash twist for free today. C-A-P-T-E-R-R-A dot com slash twist. Software selection simplified. That's all you need to know. Thank you, Captera. Welcome back to this week in uh, startups. Our guest, the co-founder and CEO of Neighborly. If you haven't tried Neighborly, I am so excited. I've been using it myself. We've been running the accelerator and I'll be doing my office hours on the 9th. Is that right? July 9th? Oh, is it tomorrow? Yeah. Okay, so I'll be at the mission uh, Mm -hmm. tomorrow, the 9th. We're taping this on the 8th where I'll be doing my office hours for the podcast and also as a front to meet my next investments. Uh, You go through the 12-week program. Each week, we bring in about seven investors who give you candid feedback. We also ask them to vote on their top three startups. Uh, And that means every week we have a first, second, and third place out of the seven companies. And we have a total score that we track over the 12 weeks of which companies were voted highest by the investors. I'm sure you know where you ranked one through seven. Or do you? Uh, Yeah, number two. You were number two. So out of your cohort, you were the second most voted for, which is great. You can pull that microphone right up. Um, Get more comfortable. Yeah. So that's great. Did you start off strong? No. We started off terribly, actually. Ah, So in the first couple of weeks, you got no votes or third place votes? Yeah, we were at the bottom. Why didn't investors early on at the Launch Accelerator understand what you were doing? And then what tweaks did you make? And how did you learn about... Let's call them the leaks in your game, as we'd say in poker. You had some leaks in Mm -hmm. your game. Of course. What were the leaks in your game that prevented you from clearing market with the investment community? And then how did you fix them? Yeah. So I only have my own internal hypothesis of of what I think changed. I didn't actually get feedback from the people who invested us afterwards. But what what I know to be true is what I changed was that in the first four weeks of the Accelerator, when I was not scoring very well... Mm. I was very much telling a story in a myopic way, just like we take these storefronts, we revitalize them, and then rent them by the hour for events, meetings, and parties. Here are the unit economics. It's profitable. We're growing. We want to make a lot more of these. Okay. That was it. And that's a, and that's a fine- Reasonable. That's a reasonable- you describe it's a, the business. It's a straightforward- completely. Yeah. It makes total sense. It works. Um, but I think what I was failing to do is to capture the imagination of the investors and really- uh, allow them to to see the vision that I have for where this could go and why it could be a unicorn, why it could be a big business. And so even though I was trying to, to kind of like basically promote the anti-Silicon Valley startup where this has positive unit economics, this is growing, this is cash flow positive, ah. this makes sense. You know, all the things that you would want to kind of, I guess, pitch a bank probably Yeah, was the way I was pitching it. And that is the way I had been pitching it in the past because we built this business on bank loans, actually, right. the, in the beginning. Wow. And so I had to kind of like, I, I had to get out of that mindset of pitching this as a day-to-day kind of myopic business. And I need to say, this is this is how it's working now, but this is only step one in a process that is going in this direction yeah. to become this type of a business. And we're going to revolutionize the way hospitality works around events Mm. and adding in those last couple slides and taking away some of the more minute details of the business model allowed me to kind of open up the discussion to to bring these investors into my head of like where i think this company has the potential to go and why i wake up excited about what we're doing and i wasn't doing that at the beginning and what i realized is like if you're not doing that at least in a slide or two everyone says you need to do about 10 percent of that in your pitches mm. to investors and i the big grand vision. Yeah, the big if grand vision. This works, where this is going. What happens? And what's exciting about this? Why does this matter? Yeah. Like, yeah. And what so, was it? How did you explain it? What's the best way for you to explain yeah. how big this could get and how exciting it can be? Yeah. I, so I spent the last two slides talking about, and credit to Aaron, uh, one of the launch founders uh, of Free Play. He, yes. He talked to me about the idea of a market network. And I had been kind of like dancing around this idea and never really put it to, to paper, but the idea really is not just the space. It is going to be a market network in the sense that, and if people want to look into this, I really highly suggest this, but NFX has a lot of uh, research on this concept called the market network. Um, and James Courier, who I spoke with, is one of the kind of one of the idea leads on this. And basically the idea is once you've got a net, the, the first generation of companies was, uh, you know, we had these marketplaces. We have Airbnb, We've got all these different things that are connecting two-sided marketplaces, and that's great. But you, at some point, 
and you and you've got social networks so you've got something like a facebook and an instagram you've got these ways that you're connecting a bunch of people together well the third wave is going to be a hybrid of those two things which is a marketplace on top of a social network so you get the stickiness and the the retention of a network and then you add a marketplace on top of it to monetize it and that's yeah. really what I realized mm-hmm. that we were doing an errand over Super Duper Burgers. Uh, uh, <laughs> gave for people me, who don't know, the yeah. context there is we don't go do happy hours or other nonsense like that. After the accelerator breaks at like 3.30, we take over a burger joint and we sit there for another hour and kind of debrief and yep. hang out. So during the debrief with Aaron from Freeplay, he said, hey, check out Market Networks, which I just pulled up on the screen. NFX is a great venture firm here that we work with a lot. We don't really compete with them. It's all very uh, collegial in the early stages. But they say that a market network is when you can combine a marketplace, which is transactions among multiple buyers and sellers, with a network, identity and communications. I guess that's like your address book, basically, mm-hmm. your yep. social graph, whatever you want to call it, plus workflow, like SaaS tools mm-hmm. and software. And when you started presenting it as that, yep. then people believe there could be a viral coefficient and it could grow. There's a way to monetize the network outside of strictly renting the spaces. So right. strictly renting the spaces, I think, is like the core product. That is what generates all of the activities downstream, but that's the top of the funnel, right? So we have to. I had to start telling a story that was going to show investors how not only this would grow as a core product, but also how we could layer more services on top of it, like what Uber did with their transportation network. They yes. started adding Uber Eats and Uber Rush and all these different ideas yeah. that you can easily layer on top once you have the core product. Uber Pool, in fact, Uber Pool. is one. All so. these different things. And so that's, that's what I started pitching. That was the main difference. And when I started doing that, uh, I saw a, a massive uptick in interest from investors and, and votes in the launch accelerator. Fantastic. And then at some point, uh, you were able to raise more money. Let's go mm-hmm. through that process. Yep. Yes. Yeah, so from a candid standpoint, you and I had talked about it with the, with the syndicate. And right. um, I'm the sure syndicate. you'll- com, The syndicate.com. For people who don't dot- know, companies that come through the accelerator, if they're in the top couple of uh, high performers, not just by votes given by other VCs, but in our judgment of our team, which typically means revenue is growing and- we see it being able to get to 100 million in revenue. So you and I talked, hey, you got you guys are breaking out. There's something here. Mm-hmm. And what happened next? Yeah, so we worked out a deal with the syndicate. So we did, instead of, I think, what the usual pathway is for a launch company is to go through the accelerator and then do the syndicate, we actually did the syndicate during the launch accelerator, which right. is a lot for me to take on. But it was the right thing because our timing was good. Our traction was good. I was already spending so much time in front of investors. It made a lot of sense just to get that syndicate process underway. You nailed the advantage. pitch already. Yeah, you had all the data I, cleaned up. You yep. had clean books, accounting. Correct. And you had answered all the hard questions yep. for what, six, seven, eight weeks? Mm-hmm. At that point, yeah, I was halfway through the accelerator. So we did the syndicate and we raised uh, $800,000 and then you guys put another 100000 in yeah. on top of that. So uh, the syndicate brought in 900000 and that was we had actually found a way to kind of pare down our seed round to say we can get everything we need to get done for 900000 and then hopefully quickly get to a Series A with this money and put this right. capital to use. Let's get back to the product. Let's go heads down and see Got what it. we can do with this 900000 Because you were kind of in the break-even range. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Maybe minus, burning 10 or 20 yeah. a month. Yeah. Something de minimis. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. In our world, de minimis, yeah. not in the real world. De minimis because we had no other capital. And right. so when this capital came in, we said, well, great. If we spent 900000 as capital efficiently as we have been, we could potentially double or even triple the size of our company with this just $900,000. And yeah. so that was the plan. We did that, uh, had a successful syndicate. We had 147 investors in this Amazing. syndicate put in. So it was around a $5,000 check on average. And If you was... were explaining to another founder how the syndicate worked, describe in broad strokes what the process is. Yeah, so the process I would actually... Uh, Ascribe similar similarly to Kickstarter in some sense. So you basically you put out a deal memo with launch. Uh, you come up with like the pitch. It's all in written form. You have all your financials ready, um, and then you go out and you say, "Great, we are opening up our company to sell shares." Uh, well, it's a safe conver- it's a safe note, but we are opening up our company to launch. Uh, syndicate investors and these syndicate investors have the chance to hear you pitch for it was uh, I think I pitched for 40 minutes and then did 20 minutes of Q&A 
So it's a live process that people can log into from around the world. That deal memo goes out in advance so people can read through your company, see if they have interest in it. If they do, they can then quickly uh, jump into your to your pitch. And so um, that was also recorded and then distributed afterwards. And so it the went webinar, out, yeah. The webinar went out. How many out people to, showed up for the webinar? About I believe it was uh, maybe 100 and. 80 or something like oh, that. Was I can't that the quite RSVPs or the I showed up? I can't quite remember, but it was a lot. Yeah. And, um, well, and so people know by context, we have, at the time you did it, I think we had 2,900 syndicate yeah. members. I think we have 3,200 now. Mm -hmm. And of those, at the time you did it, maybe twelve or 1,300 had done a deal already. Sure. Yeah. And now it's 1,600 have done a deal. Wow. So if 180 showed up, that would be about 10% of yeah. the base of the, 15% of the base of active investors at that time. Yeah, it was incredible. It's pretty impressive. Yeah, so so we did that webinar, um, did the deal memo, and that, that went out to all the syndicate members. And, and then basically they have a chance to commit any amount of capital they'd like to. I think there's a minimum on it. Um, and I then, think 2,000 was the minimum for that deal because we can have up That's to right. 250 members and they're all in one SPV, special purpose vehicle. Yep. So they're one item on the cap table controlled by me, Jason Calacanis. I make the decisions for that group of investors. Yep. I work with the founder. You don't have to work with those 147 people directly, right? but you can. Yeah, and you and said you the, don't have their names. That's right. You have an email. You can email them blindly. If they want to uncloak, they yep. can. Or if they are sort of more passive investors and just want to read your update and not have you emailing them direct, they can choose not to, which yep. is kind of nice. Yeah, and you set, you guys set the terms, so you set the cap rate and all these different things, and so it made it really easy for the syndicate investors just to either jump in or jump out, just like you would be supporting a Kickstarter campaign. So we had 147 people, like I said, commit capital to the round on average that equal out to like a $5,000 check, which was amazing. Um, and then, so once we got that capital in the bank, we went back to work and we were finishing launch accelerator still and kind of halfway through um i i guess not halfway through i was like another two towards the end yeah it was like another two weeks after the the syndicate we went on kind of the a little the track tour. yeah a little, a little track. track we do a little track yeah we made a track to my friend david Sachs's firm craft ventures mm -hmm. and it we also, and so he and his team looked at the presentations, the seven, and did he pick you as his number one? Uh, I believe so. I don't know. I think some of the other team members also did. Yeah. So he liked the business. And then immediately afterwards, he asked to just have a quick meeting. Mm -hmm. What did David Sachs, for people who know, uh, worked at PayPal, Zenefits, created Yammer, sold it for a billion, and now has a pretty amazing uh, Craft Ventures here in Silicon Valley. He's also a notable angel investor. What did Sachs uh, say to you about the business? What did he like about the business? I think what got him really excited is that their thesis is centered around physical virality. Mm -hmm. So they've invested in things like Bird, SpaceX, Cloud Kitchens, you know, these these Cafe physical- X. Cafe X. These, these physical products that impact the real world and that consumers can interact with in, in real life. And I think that that- um, that thesis that they have at Craft Ventures lines up really well to obviously what we're doing. And, and we are, of course, going to build a software platform and a marketplace on top of what we're doing. So it's not just renting these venues, but the, again, the core product of what we're doing is enabling convenient and affordable access to space for people to gather in real life. So that, I think, really resonated with, with David and the Craft team. And they saw what you saw, which is when you have a network of spaces where that are very convenient and very affordable and very easy to use, then and you've got people coming and using them for all types of things, you're capturing a lot of attention, a lot of foot traffic, a lot of um, it's just it's just a really amazing way I think to to catalyze community. Hmm. And so David saw that, and I think he saw the ability um, for this to scale um, and the virality that that we have inherent in our business is something similar to what a lot of the things he's invested in the past with. So if you think about one of our events, for example, if you bring tomorrow 50 people to our mission space for your live podcast, yep. the chances of, you know, at 10, let's say 20% of them are founders who have companies who need yep. space for offsite meetings or leadership retreats or happy hours. 10% of them might be investors. They're there because they also want to do LP meetings. They come and there's a neighborly in the window. Yep. 
And so, yeah. so like that, the virality of you bringing 50 people to our space, even if we don't make that much money, we're not trying to gouge you on, on the idea because that's not, the whole point is how do we catalyze you to do something in our space? Yep. And then how can we help you make that happen? And then whatever happens down the line, we can find other ways to monetize that that are gonna help support the space. But we wanna make sure first and foremost that, that it is as easy and affordable as possible to get together. And so the virality of that, of you bringing 50 people and then the chances of one of them wanting to book yes. our space in the future for yes. something is yes. very high. So Which, that, for people who don't know, if you see a bird scooter going by, yeah. it has the word bird on it. Exactly. Or you see one in the street, or you go by Cafe X and you see somebody getting a coffee from a robot, yep. or you get in an Uber with somebody and they rate the driver with you as they get out or they order the Uber and tell you it's three minutes away. Now you know what that is. When we get back from this quick break, we're going to give a special offer for Neighborly from Jason when we get back on this weekend's show. If you work in Silicon Valley and you work in technology, you know it's not all about ping pong tables and free food and the hoodies. Those are all fun, sure. But there are a lot of challenges throughout the startup journey and no one understands them quite like our friends at Silicon Valley Bank, where I do my banking personally have a great idea for a startup, and I do it professionally actually as well. If you have a great idea for a startup and you don't know the right way to launch it, well, Silicon Valley Bank has helped thousands of startups and is always eager to share their insights. Feel like your company's growing at quantum speed? Well, Silicon Valley Bank strives to support you at your pace, quick, nimble, and always looking ahead. With Silicon Valley Bank, you're not just getting a bank. You're getting a banking and financial services partner, along with the insights and experience and scalable solutions that founders need to move their bold ideas forward faster. I know this because I work with Silicon Valley Bank and I have for over a decade. And when I email them, man, do I get a quick response. So here's your call to action. If you're a founder, a potential founder, or just someone with an idea and a whole lot of ambition, Silicon Valley Bank has solutions that will help support you from the seed stage to the big stage. So visit svb.com forward slash next to learn more. Silicon Valley Bank. Ideas. Bank here. All right, welcome back. We teased a neighborly offer. Here it is. If you email Jason, that's my name, at neighborly, N-E-Y-B-O-R-L-Y.com, the first 100 people or so who email that will get a $100 credit for when they use a neighborly, which is only in the Bay Area and Oregon now, right? Uh, yes. Got it. So that's a hundy, which gets you basically your first hour. Mm -hmm. So if you're going to do something for two or three hours, I guess that would be pretty good. Is there a minimum number of hours? There's no minimum, no. You can do it for one hour. Mm -hmm. So literally, if I wanted to just have a quick uh, presentation, mm -hmm. I could just go for one hour and do a half hour presentation and then leave. Yeah. And you have a projector there, yep. you have chairs there. All the AV equipment. Do you give people setup time or do they have to pay for the setup time? They have to pay for the setup time. That makes sense. It's so mm -hmm. cheap. Yeah. Is there a day rate that's discounted? Um, we haven't come up with that because we really like the just committing to the hourly model. It. it just really makes sure that you're, if you're using it, you're paying for it. If you're not using it, you're not paying for it. There's no What if I wanted to do a two-day event? Yeah. Would I have to pay the 48 hours, even mm. though I overnight might be leaving my stuff there? It's like I do a two-day pop-up? Yeah, we just have an overnight fee for that. And then Got we it. usually give a 10% discount if you're booking more than 10 hours. So, so. think about that. If you were going to do a pop-up for your startup company, mm -hmm. let's say you were doing, um, you know, whatever, a uh, Dollar Shave Club, you wanted to do a pop-up mm -hmm. in Union Square. You could literally rent it for two days mm -hmm. for whatever, 12 hours a day, 15 yep. hours a day, get the overnight for free or for a fee. Yep. It only costs you like three grand to do a pop up. Yep. And you probably wouldn't have to sign a lease no. or anything. Yep. We have internet, AC, all that stuff. So you're just Perfect. set up you just, and keep your stuff in and there. I and I can bring my own food. Yep. You have a projector. Mm hmm. You have Sonos there or speakers or something? We have speakers, yep. You have speakers. And Spotify and okay. you know, it's all included. Um, what is. What am I not allowed to do there? Mm -hmm. In other words, if I wanted to have an overnight rave or if I wanted to have a dance party as part of my Sweet 16 or whatever, mm -hmm. am I allowed to have a dance party in the space? Yeah. Have people dancing, whatever? Yeah, you can dance. I mean, the only things that you can't do are were things that are illegal in any space, right? Got so it. you can't smoke inside. You can't do things like Got that. It. Um, you can't sell alcohol. Like there can't are, sell alcohol. No, makes sense because you need a, an entire license for that. Yeah. So, but if you I wanted mean, to buy tick, if you wanted to sell tickets, yeah. If I wanted to do a book reading, yep. And I want to charge twenty five bucks and include pizza and do a book reading, mm -hmm. I could. 
Totally, yeah. We've had people do comedy shows in our space. So like comedy oh. entrepreneurs who want to get out there and they can't afford to rent an expensive venue in the city. They can rent our space and they've brought oh. 40 people there and they sold tickets. And that's totally that's totally. Yeah, if you get 40 agreeable. people and you sell them tickets for $25 yeah. each, people now you got $1,000. You paid 400 for the space. Yep. You and you money. include two drinks with it or whatever, yeah. or you just, there's an open bar or mm-hmm. whatever, or there's some soda. It's great. Yeah. So Hypothetically speaking. That's the, I mean, that's the idea because at, at the end of the day, if you can build a business that people can build businesses on top of, you've got a really, really sticky and strong platform. And so that's also the idea is we really, I think we're hitting our stride from a professional standpoint as far as like meetings and things like that. When people are saying, well, I don't yet have the capital or the ability to open my own comedy club, but... And I don't like the way that these these uh, traditional comedy clubs are are taking eighty percent of the ticket sales or whatever. So I just want to I, I want to do my own thing. I want to mm. rent this place and I want to yeah. have full control over it. And I want it to look a certain way. I just love and the you fact can make that money. I can order my own food too. Yep. But in a way, you know what? I just had this like epiphany. You're kind of like an API, like Amazon Web Services, hundred percent for space. Yep. That's so it. you can just plug yourself in. That's and in fact, you can rent the spaces on Peer Space and some of those mm-hmm. other networks yep. already. Yeah. So you can book through them. Yep. On a geographical basis, how are you going to do your your rollout? Mm-hmm. Have you considered franchising or do you want to own and operate and be what we call an asset heavy marketplace? And then how do you think about cities versus suburbs versus the country? It does seem to me that the suburbs need spaces too, or am I wrong? And then are you thinking about having you know, launching 10 at a time per city or maybe doing 10 cities, one each city. How do you think about a, a rollout plan? Yeah, so that's really what we're focused on right now is to be able to scale this. Clearly, you have to have a city playbook. You need to kind of have a, a guide that our entire team can follow to be able to open these up efficiently mm. um, and to have a successful rollout. So we're going to be opening up in L.A. at the end of this year. And so what we'll be doing in L.A. is probably opening between five and 10 in a three-month period. Um, and that I, I think is, is really necessary at least to get that kind of like, uh, instant virality. We need to have more than a couple places. So, yeah, uh, some density in the past, helps because... some density because there needs to be network effects as far as using it and yeah. telling other people about it and having a space in your area of LA. Yeah, this is why I feel you got to do the peninsula here in the Bay area mm-hmm. because if people are using it in San Francisco or they use it in Berkeley or in Oakland. Oakland. And then they go, let's say they work in the city, but then they live in Atherton, Palo Alto, Redwood City, San mm-hmm. Mateo, Millbrae, whatever. There should be one on every block, just yep. like there's one Pizza Delfina or there's one, mm-hmm. you know, multiple fills, you know, one yep. fill per neighborhood. There's got to be like one per neighborhood. Yep. Yeah, I think it, I think it can definitely work in the suburbs. Um, and I, my theory is that this may even work in smaller towns because even smaller towns... I went out uh, last year to South Texas for something and right on the border, and it was a really small town called Brownsville. Um, And even in that town, they had five or six event venues, Mm. right? And these are, you know, local businesses and they're working and they were charging more than a thousand dollars a day in one of the poorest towns in Texas in the middle of nowhere. Yeah. And so that, I mean, that's more than so we charge actually, in Union Square, San Francisco. And I'm you thinking, could probably charge $50 an hour down there. Pro- yep. Yeah, even less, maybe. So 20, I think, yeah, 30 yeah, bucks an so hour. I, I do think that, I do think it has the potential to, to work in a lot of different environments and a lot of different types of places. Um, and the question as far as franchising and kind of like managed uh, spaces, we're experimenting with that and trying to figure out what mm-hmm. the different strategies are. We've looked into franchising, we looked into joint ventures. Franchising, not a good idea. Yeah, it's tough. I'll because, tell you why. Yeah, go ahead. I want to hear it. Then you have to service two people, the franchisee and the customers. And then you have this weird tension with the franchisee trying to extract value uh, and this weird tension that you don't need to have. Yeah. Like there's some massive tension going on between Subway. I saw that owners and the franchise. They were trying taking, to tank their franchisees. Yeah, they're they sending the inspectors back. out yeah. to tank their franchise. It all right? gets yeah. dirty. Yeah, you know, Cafe X had the same thing. People wanted to franchise Cafe X, and yeah. I was like, you know what? Can we get to ten yeah. machines and then make a decision? Yep. Uh, you didn't mention Sachs. Uh, Sachs met with you. Yep. The team. What happened next? Yeah, so uh, we met with David Sachs, and yeah, they, like we just talked about, they loved the idea of the physical reality. They wanted to get involved, um, and so we did some diligence with them for a couple weeks, and they came out to see our spaces, and we told them kind of the vision and where this was going to go, and showed them 
a space that we had just leased, so it was empty and kind of about to get transformed. And then we showed them our, our existing spaces and really gave them the rundown of how it works um, in person, which was nice. So we got to know them really well and they got to know our team. Um, and then they invested a million dollars. Amazing. Mm -hmm. So you get a million from us in three bets. Yep. The accelerator bet, then another hundred from the fir fund, and then another eight hundred or nine hundred from the syndicate. Yep. So that's nine hundred or a million we put in. Uh, you guys did about nine hundred. You you guys Total. and the syndicate. Uh huh. And then, then Sachs did did a million. Got with, it. With Craft Ventures, and then got we it. had a lot of angel investors who wanted who to get wanted involved. To come in. yeah. so Some involved. of which I'm assuming you met at the accelerator. Um, or not really actually. No. Okay. These yeah. are people who started to find word, out. Yeah, word started me getting Sachs around. Were in. Yeah, word started. Uh, word started to get around a little bit before that. Huh. After the syndicate, really. Gotcha. Um, and so, so what I think is some people try to that. do end runs around the syndicate. No, not yet. Yeah, we but, ban them from doing that. Yeah, that's it's a little bit of a problem. Sometimes people join the syndicate and then try to invest directly. Then we just ghost them. Yeah, it doesn't. As the kids say, it doesn't even make sense yeah. uh, from a variety of perspectives for a launch founder to. You were going to say something though about. Yeah, uh, I was just going to say so that buzz. so we got we had a lot of buzz after the syndicate and um, because the syndicate goes to three thousand people, many of which are VCs. Yep. And the angels tend to talk to the VCs and say, "I just invested in this. You yeah. should check out this company." And I would be remiss not to give another shout out to another launch founder who oh, help, has helped us immensely, great. which Tell is me. Zach Parker. Oh, so great. Zach actually introduced us once he saw what happened give with the Give a plug syndicate. to his company. Yeah. yeah. So for Look Network, it's the best place to book talent on in a flash, I think mm. is his uh, slogan. L-U-K. And it's place, L-U-K. L-U-K. Yeah. It's Luke. very trendy. Yeah. It's based out of LA, but it's a place where you can book uh, models for your shoots and production needs. Yeah. Um, and how but, did he help? He put you in touch with if investors he was working yeah, with? Yeah, Zach's a third time founder. And so he knows a lot of angels and a lot of people in mm -hmm. the technology space and who could really help us with building out our new website and who had capital and wanted to put it into early stage companies. And so he introduced me to some of the people that invested in him in previous Perfect. ways. And really, That's he That's a nice thing me. where the cohort helps each other. It was incredible. you had Meowtel in yours yeah. as well. And they uh -huh. were very helpful. Yeah. Did I, they win number one? They did, yeah. Isn't that amazing? Meowtel did incredible. Another like, marketplace she, slash network. Yeah, exactly. And, and what did you learn from her, Meowtel? I, I just learned from her. I think everyone in the cohort learned from her how much it matters to be connected to your to your mission, your product. I mean, right. she just- She's like, a crazy cat person. She just exuded cats. Crazy cat person. And you she believed, like from the very first week of the launch accelerator when everyone saw her pitch, like she's going to win. She came out and dunked on everybody yeah, week one. Yeah, she did. It was yeah, so clear. Was it's so drop. important that you have that passion Yeah. because as investors, we're looking at, at our portfolio yep. and we see people we invested a million dollars in who then quit. Yeah. And you're like, what, 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 what happened? I thought you loved cats. I thought you loved- having an event space for people to share memories and create them. And they're like, yeah, I thought so too. I'm out. Yeah. I want to go back to work at Google. Yeah. I can't it's take so, this anymore. It's so excruciatingly difficult to start a company, especially uh, in this kind of, in this space where there's so much competition and early stage funding is drying up left and right. And so like the ability to have that, to have the persistence and the dedication to make it through when you get decline for the 40th time yeah. is really, really difficult. And the only way that you're going to get over that is by actually caring about what you do, mm -hmm. loving what you do and exuding that. Because like when, when you saw Meowtel and you saw the product and what it was all about, and then you saw Sonia pitch it, you realize that like, this was a, this was an example. This was just a manifestation of her and yeah. it, it was connected. And so that meant that she was gonna go as long as this idea could possibly go and probably not give up. Yeah. And if I was an investor, I would have invested in her just based on that because dedication is probably, I think, the most I feel like underrated. we should just do a syndicate for her. I think she was waiting to like get metrics in a row and she had some offers, but I think we should just run a syndicate. One of the things I'm starting to learn is like when we spend 12 weeks with the founder, we can see in the accelerator how seriously they take it. And you probably saw this, like. We're pretty good at picking people who yeah. take it super seriously. Yeah. Like it's a, it's shocking to me how serious people are sometimes. Yeah. Like they're really, really taking every week seriously. Yeah. And I, I don't know what it is about our organization, but and maybe you have some insight having now gone through the entire funnel. You're mm -hmm. an example of somebody who's gone down the funnel we design, which is like podcast and founder university lead to accelerator, lead to syndicate, lead mm -hmm. to continued investment from the top VCs in the world. Yep. And you did that exact. Um, it's interesting how we get people who are serious. Yeah. They're just I, serious and I, dedicated. Like they do the work. One thing I would say about it that I, I think is, is a factor in that is that you guys specifically are, because you're a smaller out, 
outfit, you have more focus, uh, you commit more resources to the founder. You guys are also more serious and more dedicated to what you're doing than I think a lot of incubators are because yeah. of their size. Because once you start scaling the incubation idea, even that starts getting watery and watered yeah. down and, 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 and loses some gusto. And I Gravitas, think that like, yeah. yeah, you guys, you guys are very much dug into your own startup, which yeah. is launch. And yeah. so that comes across to the founders. And I think you guys set the tone. Um, it's important. I can like when I watch Demont work, I'm like, this guy is working fucking harder than anyone else here. Like, yeah, this is incredible. No, he's legit. You're you're not just like a f pretty face at this no, thing. You're no. literally here all I the time. I keep telling people that they're just like, wow, yeah. you have such a pretty face, and I'm like, it's not just that. It's just the makeup person it's upstairs. I did that. Yeah. No, um, I mean, if I what I find is <laughs> the core, how hard I work or how hard I take it seriously. Yeah. The, the group does. Yep. So when they see me drill into specific moments in a presentation where I'm like, go to slide seven. Yeah. Let's talk about this slide. Mm -hmm. It's like, oh. People people are watching. People are paying people attention. Are paying you're, attention. You're investing your time into it, which is more valuable yeah. than the 100000 you put into it. It's actually course, like yeah. the, the effort and the sweat equity you guys are putting into the founders, yeah. I think- it's just this like reciprocation process that yeah. there's it's it's hard to feel in a small group of people it's hard to feel like you're not going to pull your weight when everyone else around uh, you is busting their ass yeah it's a and high, so there's something good about that and i would really make sure to keep that if you can in the dna of launch because yeah the, there's a reason high expectation culture yeah if you think about education right like yeah. the bigger the class size gets it's easier to fade away in the yep. back and yep. not have to do anything and yep. no one notices mm. the smaller the class size you can't hide no and there's so no hiding that's that's kind of like no what there's you have a top three here. and then there's the four yeah and then you can look at the four and then there's out of the four, there's the two. Yep. So, and so whoever's dragging their feet, they're going to be at the bottom and we're going to be there. Yeah. Right and so I, I think if I wasn't going to, if I had the intention before applying, to like, I just wanted, this is a, this is a leisure thing for me. This is something fun I'm doing on top of my job at Facebook or something. And I'm not like, if it works great, if it doesn't, who cares? I don't think I would have applied here because yeah. it's just not the kind of place for that. It's like people here are like, this is make or break. It's do or die. There is no yeah. plan B kind of feeling here, which is really great. And I think yeah, it We try to optimize helps. for that when we select. Yeah. I remember my dad uh, told me about the army and he said uh, when he got into the army, there was a guy in the back when they were doing their 10 mile hikes with like a stick. And I said, what was the stick for? So in case you slowed down, <laughs> yeah. so what do you mean? If you fell behind, if you were in the front, there was a reward. And then if you fell behind, there was a stick. <laughs> yeah. And I was like, there's literally carrots and sticks. <laughs> I was like, they should just literally give the yeah. best runner or the best for, you know, person in the front a carrot. <laughs> but they had the stick too. And in our example, the stick is, if you're not keeping up, then I'm going to talk to you. DeMont hits you with his MacBook Pro. No, yeah. it's it's even worse. You have to sit down with us and talk to us. <laughs> yeah, oh, and I, it's so annoying to talk to me when I'm perturbed. Sure, or when I don't. I don't want to know. I don't want to know how that feels. You know, I'm gonna I stay just away kill from that. People because I can't. I go mental. Sure. When something is not working out, I go. I literally makes me mental. It's like my deficiency in life is that when something's not working, I just it it becomes all consuming for me. Sure. And that happens with the startups too. If something's not working, I sit. Forget about the founders staying up at night. Yeah, there were some founders whose pitches just weren't working. You might remember, mm -hmm. I couldn't sleep. I, I was just literally like thinking, why can't this? Why are they not getting votes? Why are people not understanding the idea? Mm -hmm. And then sometimes I just come in, I rip up the presentation, start over. Right. Let's go. Let's just redo this. What's the strongest piece of your presentation? Let's just starting mm -hmm. uh, over that. Just on a on a quick economic basis, there is it true that cities are having a retail apocalypse like I hear on CNBC. Is it best described as an apocalypse or a contraction or how would you describe what's happening to storefronts? Because we all live in yeah. towns where we see storefronts on a main strip and you know, 10% of them, the stores are closed. Mm -hmm. What's yeah. going on? Yeah, I would say a little bit of that is clickbait. Um, it's the media, obviously, so yeah, they, they the want to say something. They, they want to say they, something they, untruthful. Yeah, they clicks. need to say something that's a little bit outlandish. So I don't. I, I think that you can make a case that uh, it could be an apocalypse, but it's certainly not now. I think that that's a little bit overplayed. What mm -hmm. is happening is a slow death. It's oh, a okay. slow, it's not an apocalypse. It's a hospice rather than it's a like, nuke. Yeah, it's I nothing gotcha. like, nothing massive is happening. But I think what you're seeing, and if you dig into any 
specific subsector of retail real estate. So I'm talking about cafes, restaurants, clothing shops, art mm-hmm. galleries. If you dig into each one of those auto body places, you start to kind of see that there's a lot of weakness in each one of those subsectors, mm-hmm. and they're all in the process of being disrupted. And I hate to use that word, but that's there's a there is a process that's happening for each one of those subsectors of retail that is is concerning. And for me, when I look at it, I think that when, if you project that, uh, that disruption out another 10 years or even five years, it might get pretty ugly pretty fast, but it's, it's gonna not, get uglier. it's going to, yeah, it's, it's just, there's no way this it gets is, better. No, no, this is not going to reverse. Um, but I don't think it's an apocalypse necessarily. It is, I believe more in the it's a slow bleed. It's a slow bleed, but it's also, it's also a, I believe in the optimistic uh, stance on it, which is that it's a it's a transformation. Mm-hmm. So, our economy is has already transitioned right from industrial into information and the now to retail networks. to networks. But the 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 retail real estate and real estate in general, you see it with office. Office office is transforming with WeWork and co yeah. co working. You got the co living companies like Zeus and Bungalow and all these companies. So you see other types of real estate that's residential, that's office. You don't see it really happening yet in retail real estate. Mm-hmm. And if you talk to a lot of the brokers or landlords um, or even city planning officials about this issue, no one really knows what to do about it because it's so multifaceted. It's acute in, um, I, I live uh, in an area called Hillsborough and it's right next to San Mateo. And we have a downtown area called Burlingame. Yep. Burlingame has two streets, Broadway uh, and Burlingame Avenue. And Burlingame Avenue is like the, the beautiful bucolic mm-hmm. Apple Store, Sephora, everything, yep. Phil's, you know, Starbucks, Pete's. I think there's four coffee places on Burlingame Avenue. Yep. Then you go to Broadway, which was the old thoroughfare, and on Next Door, everybody's talking about how it is turning into a blight. It is, yeah. I walked those two streets to figure it out myself, and I was pretty taken aback. I actually had never been to Burlingame to be honest. Yeah. And when I went there, I started at Broadway and I was like, what is this garbage this armpit is of the- bar- This is Burlingame. This is always what I thought when I drove by on uh, you know, 101. But no, this was like that street you're talking about, which is the blighted street next to it. And then when I went over to Burlingame Avenue, I was like, oh wow, this is still very healthy. So it's not like an apocalypse in the sense that all this stuff is getting erased. It's just that like there is this, the, the it, from an economic perspective, really what's happening is it's actually quite simple. There is a massive oversupply of American retail real estate. So we have, I think it's around 26 square feet of retail real estate per capita in this country. Wow. And the average developed nation in Europe, I think, is around four or three. Wow. Uh, so we were just Canada crazy is around, consumers for a long yeah, time, and we needed to have a Radio Shack. That's correct. And we needed to have a Teddy the ni- Bear. We went store, wild in the '90s, and mine. we exactly we just went nuts with the consumerism in the '90s, and we built real estate to reflect that society that we had in the '90s. And uh, you can't unbuild real estate very easily. No. And so what's it's happened raising. is that <laughs> it means yeah, like knocking a building. What's going to happen is that we're going to contract a lot of these, the big box stores, a lot of unfortunately like the suburban type of spaces that were all drive to destination places. You say with malls, there's a lot of weakness in malls too, but like in general, we just have way too much retail real estate per sense. capita. So it's going to have to be first off contracted and second of all, it needs to be repurposed. It's just for the community in Burlingame that's in that area. They're just like, it's so sad to go to a street where every it's literally every third or fourth on yep. Burlingame on a Broadway is shuttered. Yep. And then it creates like homeless people sleeping in the front of those doorways. Mm-hmm. There's nobody who's cleaning the front of them. The, music, yeah. the windows are getting dirty, and it starts to look like the zombie apocalypse. Yeah. The phrase is "blight begets blight." So blight, what, be, yeah. blight, blight begets blight. Yeah. You, you literally have a massive issue. What and will I went those to storefronts go for those storefronts. So unfortunately, in and this is part of the. Part of the reason why I think it's going to be a quote unquote slow bleed is because cities and landlords don't necessarily want to face this reality. This is happening. And so they won't lower prices. Yeah, people are refusing to adjust to reality. And so the prices are still way too high. And what does retail cost in the in San Francisco and the peninsula per square foot per month? Yeah, it depends on where you are, obviously, sure. in San Francisco, Hayes Valley versus Union Square versus Soma. But we shoot for spaces that are you know, between 4 and $5 a square foot per month. So, so $10,000 a month in rent or less. Yeah, and that's about, I would say that's a little bit below average. Um, Got it. For San Francisco, 
perhaps. Uh, it's around this- six, I think. But oh, okay. but you know, uh, there there are there just needs to be a a come to Jesus moment as far as cities and landlords just accepting the fact that your American Apparel store is not coming back. Your flip flop store is not coming back, unfortunately. Right. Your That's all these different things. The, it's the like city of Burlingame now has all the retail locations that are empty. Yeah, and they're taking those locations and trying to sell them into retail retailers. I retail. saw that on their on their city website. On I the saw city that. website, yeah, I went there lobbying people yeah. to take. I was the like, spaces. this is not. It's bonkers. <laughs> but they won't – they don't understand it's a marketplace. If you lower the price, then somebody might, an entrepreneur might say, you know what? I'm going to try something. Yes, correct. But right now, the entrepreneurs are not going to say they're going to try something. And literally, they're putting signs in their windows like, we love serving yeah. the community. But yeah. we can't – we're losing money and we're working harder and we give up. And a lot of it's over leverage. So you've got a, a mortgage on that building or whatever else and you can't even afford to, to rent, rent it for the – for less than your mortgage is oh and there's all gosh. these issues going on so like when so it, people when people bought these buildings in the, in the late 90s mid 90s and they said this is only going to go up and then all of a sudden this starts happening with the changing retail landscape now like you're either just holding on to it because you don't want to do anything and you're just lazy which is the case unfortunately the case for a lot of landlords they just could not be bothered yeah um second of all it's greed um and third of all it's just that there isn't demand for those spaces yeah. and so this those three this the three facets and actually I'm, I'm speaking from experience from this uh, conference that i went to in boston actually at the end of may it was called exile on main street and it was put on by a couple yeah which is pretty uh sultry title but it was intense it was a it was a it was 50 50 people from government 20 landlords i believe and 10 entrepreneurs all from the boston area cambridge and different kind of cities and they were all coming together to try and figure out what to do with the issue that you're talking about which is like these blighted streets are turning into blighted neighborhoods and really affecting a lot of different things and what can we do to figure this out and what i presented at that conference as neighborly being a solution for some of these streets or these storefronts and obviously we are a uh, right now a small solution to helping that but we're, we are a solution and we are thinking about things differently which i think is the main point of it um but what we came out of from that conference with was the fact that like this problem has to be solved by these three stakeholders it has yeah. to be a combination of city zoning and planning landlords mm. and entrepreneurs and we have to come together in that kind of a fashion that we did in boston to talk about what are the entrepreneurs putting out there? What do the landlords, how can yeah. they adjust this reality? And then how can the city facilitate those transactions? Because yeah. the permitting and the zoning is a nightmare. And the reason we're not in Burlingame is because what we're proposing to do doesn't fit into the 10 types of businesses that existed in 1999, uh-huh. unfortunately. And they're trying their hardest. And I've looked at their website so and they're an doing some proposals. So is not in their wheelhouse. <laughs> yeah, not really. Because it doesn't fit. Like, it's not a restaurant. It's not a cafe. It's not a and clothing store. It's not an office. And on that street? Yeah, the city does. Really? Yep. It, see, that's so, so that's overreaching the really... and weird. Yeah, when so that's the When you think about American thing. freedom and society, yeah. that a town yeah. gets to determine who uses each storefront for what. And, is yeah. that a leg- Do you think, where did that come from? And is that legitimate? And could you fight it in court? Um, you'd have to fight something that's been going on for a hundred years, but maybe longer. But I think that, what I think that called? zoning, zoning, in, it's basically urban planning, urban but planning. urban planning is really critical because if there was no urban planning, everything would just be a Google office. Ah. Right. So like we have to have some parameters on how commercial right. spaces can be used. Which Otherwise happened in Palo Alto, Palantir and Google were buying every office up and down university yeah. or any space. Right. But they wouldn't let them buy the storefronts. Yeah. Because it would shut down the whole neighborhood if, if everything was a Google office. And so not to single out Google, but anyone who could take a lot of space in an unfettered mm-hmm. matter with no limitations yeah. will turn our neighborhoods into tech offices, offices. Yeah. and if, in San Francisco, for example. And so what that's something that we have to be cognizant of while at the same time understanding that specific zoning, mm. really restrictive zoning you, for things like against what we're doing, for example, it's not even against it, it's just like unclear. Um, cities, I think, just have to come to the table and say, great, like Mayor, London Mayor Breed is doing a fantastic job with this. She? She's come out with something called flexible retail, which is allowing stores like a barbershop to sell coffee, 
and oh. a coffee shop to have an art gallery and an art gallery to be yeah. something else like a co-working space. Up, less some innovation. Yeah, yeah. And so previously you you could only have one business license for a space and you couldn't do this multi-tenant, multi-concept kind of yeah. idea. And so there is innovation happening and I think I, I'm really optimistic after going to this Boston conference with like the cities are going to figure it out and they're going to adjust. It's just that this stuff takes years to undo mm -hmm. and untangle. And so I think we'll start to see it when this hottest economy we've ever had does slow down at some point, which will happen. It's going to expose a lot of festering wounds that are only being covered up right now because the economy is so hot. Once right. this economy turns, I wonder if this is the it's going to get really bad. Do you think this has any chance of being a, that retail has a chance of being a black swan event or commercial real estate? It could be. Yeah. I mean, it's it's really up in the air because I don't think anyone is, like I said, facing the reality of it. But once the economy turns and a lot of people close up shop, it's going to get ugly really fast. And so at right, that point- Right, because they're just not going to be able to keep up with the rent. No. So if you lost, if you had gonna... a contraction of, let's say, 30% on consumer spending yeah. at, the, at those even stores- Even 20%, yeah. Or tw even 10 or 20. Uh -huh, yeah. Let's just pick 15. 15% consumers are scared because the stock market Restaurants, loses- Restaurants, cafes, everything. 30%. What will happen? It's going to be bad. And it's so, going to be bad because those comp those are just hanging on by their teeth. Yep. And so what I teeth. what I think will happen then at that point because that is going to happen is that the cities will come back to the table and they will and towns even too are going to propose more flexible, uh, less restrictive zoning and and more kind of entrepreneurial and innovative uses that allow people to do things that maybe in the past we were like oh we don't want someone to have a. Um, we don't want someone to do pop-up shops here because it's not that's not a permanent use, not good for the neighborhood. Well, whatever is active and positive is going to be good for the neighborhood. Yeah. Let's let it happen. What Let's if you make had it a, what if you had a pop-up shop that had twenty six different tenants during yeah. the year? That'd be amazing. It would be amazing because yeah. every time you go by, you're like, oh wow, look, they're doing bathing yep. suits for summer. Oh look, they're doing whatever back to school. Oh yep. look, they're doing art. Yep. And so, so that's right kind of now, what we're doing. So we want to be able to to utilize real estate mm -hmm. in that way to make it more flexible so to make it. Uh, basically, not I wouldn't use the word on demand, but really convenient upfront pricing as affordable as possible, so that you don't it, have an app yet, though. Catalyzes not yet, so it catalyzes all going. these uses. Ooh. Yeah, that's what use of proceeds is going to be with this round. Um, it's going to be a new website, a new booking platform, yeah. and then Booking's critical. Yeah, so will we, I be able to invite guests through the platform then? Uh, like Eventbrite, yes. kind of, yes, or Airbnb will. does. Yeah, you'll so have that'll be the big. You'll one. have a multi-user interface yeah. so you can be like Jason and and Demont and Sam can book a space in Boston right together, and you can all see. It in your and platform. then we add the attendees, yes. and they get a notification send, through Neighborly. Correct. You can send them an evite or something like that. So, so there's a lot of ways that we can, you know, continue to improve this business with the software perspective. Because right now we're no code business. It's Squarespace. Wow, that's so amazing. It's Squarespace. You built a million dollar no code business, no developer. No. Just using Squarespace and Typeform or whatever. Just upstairs. Survey Monkey. Just upstairs before this, I was updating the website to make it so that people could put the promo code. Use the, the promo code Twist for I Squarespace. I did that, and I don't and even know what I'm doing. off on any demand. <laughs> I don't know if they're an advertiser <laughs> on this episode, but that is amazing when you think yeah. about it. You do a Squarespace. Squarespace site is incredible. For twenty five so, bucks a month, and you're done. Yeah, I built the website. I don't know what I'm doing. Two years ago, it's been upgraded by our head of design, but we still operate with just Acuity, email, Google Calendar, Google Suite, and Squarespace, basically. We've all tied all tools. those things together yeah. in Zapier, and all of a sudden you got like, you all got right. a company that works and you can find funding and, all right. and operate. Ben, for my Patreon audience only, you and I have had the discussion getting to $100 million in revenue. We're currently just over a million in yearly revenue. But you and I need to get this company to a hundred million, and do you know the reason why we got to get to a hundred million? Because um, it gets me my seventh unicorn, <laughs> and that's all that matters. I figured is the number, to you, yeah. the number of unicorns <laughs> in my Twitter bio, bio is how I dunk <laughs> on the world. So I need you to be number seven, yeah. eight, or nine, superhuman yeah. and Fitbot and blockable. What's the character limit on the in the? Uh... Oh, I'll just in open a second Twitter account. Don't worry about it. <laughs> I'll just start putting like, anyway. <laughs> What's your plan to go from 1 million to 10 and 10 to 100 million in order to get me another unicorn? Go. So, it's going to be so magical in four years when this becomes a unicorn. I'm pulling this video out and all those videos yeah. of you awkwardly presenting at the accelerator. <laughs> you got to and... trash those ones. That was no, part no, of the no. Oh, contraire, my friend. Oh, that's editorial. Me in a goal. full suit down here. You in a full suit. Yeah. 
just sweating not it out. being able to answer the most basic questions right. about your business. <laughs> Completely embarrassing. What is your name? It's going to uh, be great. Uh, this, 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 uh, <laughs> uh, all right, here's the offer. You're at a million in revenue. If you double the revenue, you can double the valuation, and I'll give you another two million. So when you're ready, I am so excited about your business. I want to put more money in. So you let me know. You double the revenue, triple the revenue. I'll do double the amount of money at double mm -hmm. the valuation or whatever. Maybe even a little more. Who knows? But I am ready to watch this business go from a million to a hundred million. I predict you'll do it in five years or less. Hmm. I think the trajectory will be one million this year is what we're looking at. No, uh, at least three this month, this year. We'll do we three did, this year. We did, uh, yeah. Okay. We're already at a two million run rate. We're at a two million run rate mm -hmm. right now. Yeah. Okay, so let's say two million run rate. I think next year you get to what, five, six? Mm -hmm. Six. Sure. I think six at least. Yeah, so let's yeah. say seven. Seven in year yeah. two. Then in year three, 20. Mm -hmm. Year four, we hit 45. Yep. Year five, yum, yum, 100. It's going to happen. It's, I believe it. All right, everybody. This has been This Week in Startups. Thank you to Director Sir Charles. Thank you, Master Nick. Thank you to my interns. Antonio, Peter, and Paige doing a great job. And thank you to our managing director of education, Jackie, who has made our content the greatest and who is solely responsible for Foundry University and you being here. Emmy award winning producer. Emmy award winning. And you are her fifth Emmy. Mm. Yum, yum. And she's got a taste <laughs> of the carry on your deal. So you're going to get a. Oh. Yeah. Jackie's going to get one of those houses in the Berkeley ja Hills. Ja Jackie Jake might House go to the Jackie island. That's fine. House. Yeah. <laughs> those aren't cheap up in the hills there. All right. I'm not saying anything about a Hillsborough or Atherton house. Take it easy. But well, I thank think you guys so much for having me. It was you. amazing. It was a really good conversation. And I appreciate your whole team. So and remember, Jason work. at neighborly.com. N-E-Y-B-O-R-L-Y.com. You email Jason at Neighborly.com and Ben will get that email and give you $100 towards your first Neighborly. My God, what if I got you a thousand people to do that? Would that be good? Uh, maybe not tomorrow, but eventually it would eventually be good. Eventually it would be yeah. good, yeah. But you get their email addresses so you can always <laughs> yeah. put them on your list. Yeah. We'll and they can use it anytime. All right, there you go. All right. We'll see you all next time. Bye-bye.